to the veteran or the, the, the brother or sister that's still in uniform and they have some aspirations about going in business for themselves, you know, what, what, what guidance would you, would you give them if business, if finance, if real estate is a direction they want to go in, in terms of just staying focused in on that, on that transition? I think probably the most important thing is just to have your foundation laid out, right? You know, yeah, I would just tell people, you know, get, get your finances in order and then don't be afraid to bet on yourself. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it, whether, and there's so many ways to do that, right? I mean, you can, you can go the route of just being really dang good at sales and finding something that makes sense to sell insurance, real estate, loans. Like there's so many products that you can, yeah. if you get good at sales and you get good at networking, you can crush it in so many industries. But then the other approach is just find something you're really freaking passionate about. And really you can build a business around pretty much anything. Yeah. You're passionate enough about it. Yeah. And I think if you, you know, if you can get your finances in order and just like have enough to live on and then be willing to bet on yourself, no matter what that looks like. Yep. It could be all right in the long run. My oh, man, I love it. So, so what's your approach? So how do you, so what I was thinking to myself is, Number one, how does somebody research to find those with low interest? Is it just knowing people or is there, a, there's a, is there a database somewhere you can find out? Is it, and then what's your approach to somebody when you find out that opportunity? You know what I would be doing right now is I would be, I would look for homes that were purchased. I would probably go 2019 just to be safe, but 2020 for sure, right? When rates were crazy low, but 2019, they were still pretty low. Even 2017, I mean, rates weren't above 4% from like 2015, they were all 4% or less. But if you hit 2020, for sure, you're gonna get low, but even 2015 on any of that, you're gonna be under 4%. Um, okay. But if you look at, well, cause yeah, cause people did a refi. So you, you'd probably wanna see if you could pull data on originated <laughs> loans, okay. 2020 or newer, uh, with owner occupied mortgage. So you go to title company. houses. So for that, for yeah, you could, you could do title company, you could do owner occupied mortgages that were originated within 2020 or newer, or, uh, you know, there's a website like prop stream, which I use, but you could also just go MLS and just see homes that were purchased. Yeah. 2015 or newer where the owner lives in the house. So you have to be a realtor to be able to they have access to MLS. Uh, d depending on where you live, there's, there's some systems you can, you can okay. get access to that okay. stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but title company can give you, yeah. Sure. I mean, for nominal price, it, depending on who you talk to, you can get it for free. I mean, cool. I mean, most of this stuff is public record. It's just, you gotta be just getting, you know, it's like anything, right? You didn't bring in a coffee, some cookies and you your know, lunch break, uh, had sweet. throw them a bone. I'll tell you this. I, I had a, a buddy, I'm going to rephrase that a former employee, <laughs> former 1099 contractor, I'm not even going to use the word employee, um, guy who, when he left the company, he, st he exported all my leads to himself. Oh, damn. Yeah. And so we signed a letter yeah. that said basically like, Hey, any transaction you do over the next 12 months, yeah. if it's on this list of people. And so Indeed. the deal was like over the next 12 months, any property that he purchased that was either an address or an owner on that list, he would have to abide by the original, uh, commission split. So like basically he would have to give me the majority share as if he had still been an employee. And so I reached out to him that annual April 15th was the, the date. So I reached out to him. I was like, Hey, I just need a list of whatever you transacted over the last year. Crickets. I knew it was going to be crickets, but I wanted to send that email because yeah, documented, you know, yeah. and it was kind of fun to send that email. <laughs> Let's be real. It's subtle, like screw you, <laughs> but it was a super professional email, but it's also sure. like an email that I know was not fun to open. Um, total crickets. But I just shot an email to the title company and was just like, Hey, uh, can you pull this for me? And I had it two hours later. So you know, I have a really good relationship with the title company that I work with Kane and the guy that I do all the business with was like, yeah, here's everything. And it, I just highlighted the properties that were actually under that person's name in LLC. And then tomorrow I'll just sit down with the lead list and just, you know, control F just <laughs> check every dream. And it's only, it was kind of disappointing. It was only 14 transactions. So. I don't know if it'll match up, but what's some of the things that turn you off about how life insurance strategies are promoted online? But if it, you know, it, it's funny because I think it could basically be summed up as the things that turn me off about life insurance is when people try to make it sexy. 
<laughs> because what you're alluding to is exactly the same thing as in almost every investment strategy, right? We talked about it a minute ago. You're like, you're only a huge fan of day trading. No, I like index funds and I like buy and hold value investing in stocks. Not a huge fan of house flipping. I mean, it works. You're right. But I would much prefer to have a house that I just hold on to for... I buy a whole guy. Yeah. Um, not a huge fan of like... You're a wholesale guy? You know, I had a wholesale company for about two years with, with the intent of I would wholesale two properties to keep my marketing budget alive so that I could renovate and hold a third or fourth. But even that was, it was such an actively involved business that after about a year and a half, two years, I sold it to a friend who's crushing it. He's making six figures a month right now. Um, and he's doing very well, but I sold it to a friend and the way that I sold it was, Hey, I'm going to sell this to you. I want 10% of the net proceeds for the next three years. And I want first right of refusal on one deal a month. So I still got my cool. deal a month. Yeah. I want nothing for the first, like nothing at sale but I don't want to have to actually do the market. So every cool. month I get whatever deals he lands, I get to say, hey, I want that one. Cool. I'll have to do it with that. If you found the right operator, the one that wanted And he's crushing it. Um, and he lives in Medellin and he's living in Colombia. Life, and, and, yeah, and he loves it. Uh, he's got himself a, you know, a Novia. And, <laughs> and, and so uh, life's good for him. But, but to answer your question, right? So like insurance is one of those things that I don't, I don't know is it not to like insult insurance, but like, I don't know that insurance is meant to be sexy. It like, it's like uh, a lawyer. It's like cement. How do you make cement sexy? Yeah. It's like a steel bead, right? Like <laughs> I don't want my attorney to be sexy. I want my attorney to cover my ass. I want, uh, you know, I mean, it don't, and I'm sure like insurance can and is, and I'm, there are wonderful reps out there who do a great job of articulating things. But the moment that something that is supposed to be a, Hey dude, this is not, it's like safety. Mm. Nobody wants the safety dude around until something goes wrong. And then you're like, oh crap, we should have had that guy around. I don't want like the insurance guy that's like, look at how amazing it all is. Like you want all these flashy things, like something seems off, you know? So, you know, the thing that gets me is when we talk whole life, Steve, it is from there are a million different ways to do this and there's strategies that fit all kinds of walks of life right like if you can get a whole life and you are way more knowledgeable about this than i am and there's strategies for in fact we probably need to talk about strategies for you know young kids forge generational wealth pitch that scope i don't necessarily understand and i know i'm missing an opportunity on um but when i usually think through it and hear about it it's revolving on young service members who don't have the capital to overfund, you yeah. know, uh, yeah, you're an E1, E2, E3. <laughs> yeah. So the reality is they're being pitched on, you're going to be able to get this policy, put money in. And what they usually end up hearing is like, you're going to immediately be able to pull it out of the savings account. And it's like, no, you probably won't be able to do it for seven, eight years. Yes. Yep. You're going to, yes. you're going to earn, earn a return on it while your capital is deployed. But the person who's telling them that doesn't actually know if that's true because they don't even understand the difference between the two different types of policies, you know, and they're saying things like, yeah, you're going to have this massive death benefit and also this mass cash value. It's like, which is it? Cause yeah. they're, it's, you, you can't structure that way. <laughs> exactly. And, and that's the other thing that drives me nuts is every insurance rep I've ever heard in my group when I start calling them out on stuff goes, well, it's just cause that person doesn't know how to structure it. Every single one of you says that nobody else knows how to structure it. So what, like who does that? Yeah. Um, so my, my biggest thing, I guess, is really just, it's like, it makes sense to me for the people who've already accumulated a little bit of wealth and, you know, can afford to put some capital in and they're in the like cash preservation or saving or what we were talking about, where it's like, you gotta hide some cash from, from risk or, uh, or in a recessionary, you've got capital, you need to, um, like there's a lot of reasons that it absolutely makes sense, but most of them start with the premise of having money. And so I, where I get jaded is when it's like, you don't have money and it's pitched as a get rich quick, yeah. like accelerator. Yeah, it's horrible. 
And it's like, well, actually the opportunity cost of losing that seven, six, seven, eight years before you're going to be able to really tap into that money again mm. is not helping that person. Yeah. What you just stood for from a financial standpoint just got ripped out from under you. It's not like you've been around for 10 years and had the, the mental maturity of a 26, 28, 30 year old man, let alone the experience to do it. So you know, what, what are your thoughts on the financial morale of, of service members? Yeah. You know, there's death. definitely a lot of things that we could do better. I mean, the thing, like one of the things that drives me the most nuts is hearing like the whole, we don't get paid enough. Like the, like, it's just, people don't know how to read their leave and earning statement. Right. And so they think they make no money. Service members have such a leg up they and they just crazy. don't know it. <laughs> like how many yeah. people leave the military and go, oh shit. I got to make all this money just to make the live the life I was living in freaking the barracks. <laughs> it's, it's like, man, you joined the military and most people had no debt when they joined. But if they did, you know, the service member civil relief act drops your interest rate to 6% on anything like hat, you know, yeah. mandated. And so like you basically join the military with borderline financial freedom. Yeah. You know, like your housing's paid for your food paid for your, and all this, whatever. Yeah, your your food's paid for, your your housing's paid for, your medical's paid. For, oh my gosh, dental. that's a big one for. No, it's huge. Medical and, and dental. Yeah, especially when you're a young idiot like we were. And I, I got hurt all the time, you know, whether I went to medical or not. But you know, and you, you can eat the chow hall. You could. Yeah. I mean, you could literally go your whole four years not even buy a car. You could save. You could invest your almost your entire paycheck. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could. You could walk to most duty stations. You live close enough. You could walk to your, huh? your get work. a damn bike. Yeah, you get a bike. You can walk to your work. in Okinawa. I mean, yeah, ten I, miles over there. I didn't have. Yeah, I walked everywhere in Okinawa. When I went to Pendleton, I I carpooled with people for a while. I had a Harley then, but whatever. <laughs> um, but I mean, like, yeah, I used to tell people, I'm like, dude, you don't even need a vehicle to like go out with the buddies. Like, you can DD for your friends. Not that everyone wants to do that, but if you DD for your friends, like, yeah, you know, you. You get all the fun stories. You get to drive all their cool cars, and you don't have to pay for them. Yeah, um, you can. If you're smart, like I, there's a there's a guy I had on my podcast. His name's Jabar Adasada, and he purchased his first duplex as a single barracks marine. He was a lance corporal when he went under contract. Bought it, picked up corporal. His command signed off on him buying it, even though he didn't have BAH. He was a barracks marine. He he managed to get yeah. approved for the loan. And he's still in the barracks. And so he bought it, moved into one half and like, you know, whatever. And dude's got, I think three houses now and like an Airbnb and like still doesn't even have BAH. He's got permanently uh, pristine barracks room rated for inspection. Yeah. <laughs> he just got dusted yep. down. And, and yep. It's so great. If you can give me your top five stupid military mistakes yep. that will keep you from becoming a millionaire. Because, you know, there's so many great things about the military that you can financially set yourself up for success. But if you were to, if you were to give, if you were to brainstorm, yeah, I don't know, three, four, five, whatever, that, that derails a brother and sister in uniform for life after the military that gets them financially set back versus maximizing the time that we're in, what would you say that, what would you say that would be? Yeah. The first one's, you know, debt right off the bat. I mean, not that, I mean. Let me rephrase that. Bad debt, right? I love debt, but <laughs> the bad debt. Man. Yeah, I got five million dollars. So the depreciation. Most, most of my debt is wonderful. Okay. Um, you know, but but bad debt. Yeah, debt debt on credit cards and vehicles and yeah. uh, you know, and and I should preface as vehicles that don't make you money and credit cards that aren't on things that are sure. made, like any kind of debt that's losing you money or on depreciating assets, right? Sure. Um, I, not educating yourself and i don't mean college don't get me wrong college is whatever it's great if you have a super unique skill set for a job that you actually want to do that you're going for but i mean you know educating yourself reading reading a book or listening to a podcast or learning a specific skill set like sales or copywriting or building a funnel or you know whatever that might be digital marketing something super tangible for today's world, uh, so I say, if you're wasting time, not learning, waste. I mean, you're sitting around 
you know, hurry up and wait. How much time do we sit around in our butt, right? You got a phone, learn something. Um, so, you know, debt, not learning, negativity, right? Unfortunately, people seem to get kind of sucked up in the like, just negative, yeah. like, why did I do this? The military, blah, blah, blah. This is stupid. Like, nah, man, and enjoy it. Like, there was a lot of bullshit that goes on in the military, but it was some of the best times of my life. I loved it.